and welcome back to Otaku No Video as always. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's talk fan service. A lot of folks like to bemoan fan service. A lot of folks uh, enjoy fan service. A lot of folks think that fan service is no big deal. And the thing is, there's different kinds of fan service. Some more problematic than others. I've identified at least four types and I'm open to defining others, right? But I think these are the ones that I've seen the most and I think are, are most useful to differentiate between. The first one I would say is what I would call referential fan service. This is where an anime series will have an, uh, a visual image or a joke that just refers to something that is in um, pop culture, in otaku culture, things along those lines. There's nothing sexual about it, there's nothing goofy about it, it's just a, really just a reference to something. It's like Big Bang Theory. Like Big Bang Theory is constantly referencing geek things um, as a form of fan service. Sometimes they're joking about it, but sometimes it's just there so people will say, oh hey, that's a joke about Doctor Who. That's awesome. Or that's a joke about you know this comic book character. Um, and this is a fairly recent style of fan service in uh, in anime back in the 70s and 80s you really didn't see a lot of anime um, pulling in these callbacks to otakudom or Japanese pop culture because there wasn't an otakudom to, to speak of at that time um, it was just getting started that is so it just didn't make sense for there to be jokes about other anime series in anime uh, but we're start, we've seen that more and more often, especially in the past decade or so since the launch of Haruhi Suzumiya. Uh, Lucky Star, what you see over here, is a great example of that. In the Lucky Star OVA, uh, one of the characters shows up with the costume of Yuki Nagato and the other as um, Hatsune Miku in a dream sequence. And it's just a fun way of referencing an, uh, you know, an element of of anime or something something else that folks just know about right so it's, it's out there but it's a it's a very innocent kind and very um you know simple kind of fan service then there is what, we, what we'll call subcultural fan service and this is kind of related but this is where you're actually um making fun of and referencing a certain aspect of um anime culture or some other subculture of otakudom so you might make a show that is um, heavy on military elements or heavy on some other aspect of a subculture in, a, in a, a, an attempt to bring in those fans. Moe series frequently are um, attempts to get fans of that particular subgenre or, or fans of a particular type of character. Uh, Girls und Panzer is a great example of that because it is there to, uh, to get the military otaku, the tank otaku, it's all about tanks, um, and all these cute girl otaku, because there are lots of cute girls in the show. And uh, Harley Suzumi is a great example of a show that, that actually does this, but also makes fun of it. Part of the, the concept of Harley Suzumi is kind of playing on moe, on, on uh, otaku tropes like moe and a magical girl and things along those lines. So while this is also a referential kind of uh, fan service, um, it is also specifically trying to, you know, it's not... So referential fan service is essentially in passing. It is something for somebody who's already watching the show to laugh at. Subcultural fan service is an attempt to to appeal to a certain kind of fan to get them to watch the show. It's something more ingrained into the show and that is something more likely to show up in advertisements for the show. If somebody watches a trailer or a commercial for the show they're more likely to see this thing and thus possibly try it out because it appeals to their particular subculture. Um, again, whether that's video games, uh, MMOs, with all the MMO-based anime stuff, stuff along those lines. So that is a form of fan service where you're appealing to that kind of thing. Then we get to the fan services that are um, more obvious. There is the fan service that I'll call the... Oh, and I should point out, um, because this video um, deals with certain aspects of, of anime culture to pander to fans, there is a little bit of subject of, um, sorry, of suggestive imagery in this video. And if that offends you, if it's a problem, if you're underage, please move on uh, because we're about to get to that point. So the third type of fan service is what I call the innocently sexual fan service. 
This is where a character is shown in various states of undress, um, or the camera will linger on certain aspects of an anime character. And yes, I know you're not looking at my face at this point of you know guys and some of you girls. The but importantly within the context of the show, the material that you're being that, that is being shown to you does not have a sexual connotation. In other words, um, the characters themselves are not flaunting their bodies. The characters themselves are not, um, uh, you know, doing something to appeal to somebody, right? Um, a great example of that is, and this is, by the way, from Fairy Tale, um, but a great, great example of that is from the Tenchi Moyo OVA, original OVA, the first Tenchi Moyo series, where there's an episode set in a bathhouse and various girls entering the, you know, entering the water and some of that is sexualized and that is not sexualized and that is very innocently sexual in that the reason they made the episode and the reason the girls are showing up in um you know in various states of undress is as fan service to the fans but the characters themselves are not showing off to other other characters except in one case um but it, it is innocent within the context of the show right and this is what fan service was traditionally meant as in anime. So until recently, when somebody talked about fan service, they were typically referring to this kind of thing, where, you know, um, a character's top would pop off, or, you know, a, a male character would rip off his shirt and have you know, all, these, all these muscles. And it was not meant to suggest that the character themselves, uh, or themselves, was trying to be, you know, um, uh, was trying to pander to the audience, but that the moment itself was clearly pandering to the audience, clearly showing something to you know, appeal to that audience. But then there's a fourth type, and this is where things get, you know, even more interesting. And this is what I call sexualized fan service. This is where a certain type of, um, of imagery, um, typically sexual or um, sometimes it's violent imagery as well, is baked into the show. This is from Akashic Records of Bastard Magical Instructor, where the characters' outfits are strip, you know, quite strip, ah, excuse me, quite stripperific, right? Um, they have these almost fetishistic school outfits, schoolgirl outfits. You see this in Queen's Blade is a great example of that, where the characters are walking around in these ridiculously revealing outfits. And Queen's Blade has a lot of just you know weirdly sexual um, stuff as well. But uh, Tenjo Tenge is another good example where characters are, are often you know, um, have, have clothes blown off, things along those lines. Um, and so this is fan service where it's not momentary, right? It's not a character walks into a bath. This is something where the, where a, an otherwise normal aspect of the show, um, and it may not be all the way through the show, but an otherwise normal aspect of the show is made in a way that is obviously titillating. That is obviously um, there to you know, attract the male gaze, for lack of a better term, or the female gaze. Um, and by the way, you can also see a form of there is also kind of a variation of this with gore and violence. You'll have shows that are kind of violence focused, where you know there's whenever there's a, a an excuse to beat somebody up, they're beat up. Um, you know, there can be that kind of violent you know, that violent fan service as opposed to sexualized fan service. But we see sexualized fan service a lot. And this is the one which gets more problematic. Um, because traditional one-off fan service was temporary. It was a momentary thing that was meant to kind of again, evoke kind of a reaction and kind of a, a laugh. But wasn't endemic to the characters. Right? The characters weren't walking around wearing outfits like this. And that's where I think we can have problems because the characters end up turning, because it sexualizes the characters, right? It, it gives the characters this sexual element all throughout the show, um, even when the characters aren't that, right? I mean, these are supposed to be shows about characters, about people, about human beings not real human beings, but when you then dress them up in certain ways, or you draw them in certain ways, 
that becomes the thing that attracts one's attention. Masami Obari, famously, is a uh, an anime character designer who works on a lot of mecha shows. And he often draws characters with large breasts. And anytime there's an excuse for Gainax bounce, you, you know those characters, oh, yep, there they go. Um, and it's just kind of fetish, fetishistic. It's sexualized. It's sexualizing the characters. And it becomes harder to take the characters seriously when the creators are doing this to them all the time. Um, you know, the, the problem is that sexualizing characters in this way can rob them of their potency as useful characters because you're doing this one thing with them all the time. It's like taking a character and having to do pratfalls all the time. At some point, you stop taking them seriously, right? Because that's what you're showing them us all the time. So when this fan service is worked in constantly, and again, this is nothing against Akashic Records. It's nothing against any of these anime series. I'm not saying that this is you know, an evil that must be stopped. Um, I'm saying that this kind of thing has effects and it has problematic results in shows. Uh, it's like in, in video games, you know, if a company comes out with a video game and the players in there are constantly throwing hate speech at each other and the company doesn't do anything about it, that's kind of weird, right? You'd expect the company to, find, to figure out some way of like allowing you to report or block or deal with that kind of stuff. If they're just like, well, that's just, you know, reality. It's like, no, you have some, you, know, you are the creator here. Somebody decided to draw those outfits, right? Um, somebody decided to do, that, to do these to these characters. Everything in an anime series, and this is an important point, everything in an anime series was intentionally drawn, right? In a live-action movie, a character can show up with an outfit, a character can wear something, and it is somewhat intentional, but it's not intentional in the same way that drawing a line is. Um, so that is why fan service is not simply an not simply a fun occasional thing when it's baked in like this when sexualization is baked in as a form of fan service um that's kind of a problem and uh, as mike points out in the chat room nudity sells and hate speech probably doesn't um I mean, it can as we, we all agree um but that's the thing is that it's really important to 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 point out that whether it sells or not, you know, you have a responsibility to do that in a way that is responsible, right? To recognize the effects of the things you create, uh, for better or worse. So you know, be aware of that, um, and uh, and and be aware that and and Nuku Design in the chat room is putting out the difference between diegetic and non-diegetic fan service. Um, and, and that is certainly an important thing. Look that up, and it's, it's a whole another aspect of all this. Um, but the point here, too, is that you can create fan service that is appropriate in universe. It's still fan service, right? It is still appealing. It, it is still it is still appealing to certain base instincts that get in the way potentially of your show and the point you're trying to make. Um, it can be done well. It can be done, you know, very interesting. Shimonetta is a great example of a show that, oh, deals with it is, you know, the role of fan service is actually fundamental to the concept of the show and, you know, the, the existence of naughty material and perverted material is part of the show's plot. And so that is a, you know, that is a thing where they are saying, okay, yes, this is a very fan service show, and we're making a point about that. But that also doesn't absolve them of the fact that that still makes it a fan service show. It, 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 it gets in the way when that's what you're showing at us all the time, right? As Dropkick says in the chat room, it threatens to cheapen the message of the show. Because, it, it, again, it, it attracts the male gaze, or the female gaze, or whatever. Um, it just... This is how our brains are wired to see things in certain ways and to view things in certain ways. And throwing these things on there and saying, oh, well, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Or, oh, well, it's just, it's just for fun. Uh, you know, there is an aspect of that that's true. 
know, we don't have to get too worried that, you know, watching this will turn us all into perverts, right? Um, but there's a lot of it in anime, and when it becomes preponderant, we have to start getting worried. We have to start thinking about what effect that has on, um, on us and on our hobby. Another important thing, too, is that this affects perceptions of the hobby. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up. When someone wants to talk about anime and they type in fairy tale, right, and they see this, they're going to get a certain impression of the show. Um, there's a lot of various, you know, effects of these things when fan service is so, when this kind of sexualized fan service, um, or even innocently sexual fan service, is so prevalent, people are going to see that, and they're going to draw conclusions about what you're doing. Um, and again, I'm not saying that doing it once is horrible, never do it once, I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's there a lot. Um, so yeah, so those are the four types of fan service. Hope this is helpful. Um, again, there, there's, um, it's important to recognize that this is a, that there are different ways of seeing this and different kinds of fan service and that when someone complains about it or when somebody says, oh, it's no big deal, it's important to realize that they may be talking about a different kind of fan service than you are, that, you know, the kinds of things that they're complaining about or not complaining about is different than what you're, you're seeing. Um, and then also it's, it's, it's appropriate to recognize that this is important and this is complicated and that, um, it's all part of one big industry that does a lot of different things, has a lot of different effects, and this is all tied into lots of different aspects of anime fandom. Um... And yeah, as you say, Hem, in the chat room, um, if parents don't understand the fan service parts, then they let their kids watch anime, and then up comes, you know, some naked girls, that's going to change the parents' opinion of anime very quickly. Uh, you know, we, we, we gotta be aware that these things are, are, are important and are impactful, right? Um, so yeah, so that, that, those are the four types of fan service. Again, hope this is helpful. And I uh, hope you will uh, check out my uh, many other videos on here about different other aspects of anime. And um, yeah, I will see you around.